um, Moshe Makova and Yasmin Mather. And they're going to talk about the Middle East, Middle East politics after the United States election. Um, Moshe will speak first, and then Yasmin will come in second. Um, can I just remind you of one or two technical uh, issues? That uh, if you want to take part in the discussion, ask a question, or make a contribution, please use the um, blue hand function or the raise hand function using the participants uh, button. It's on the bottom of your screen. Uh, you can also use the question and answer section. That's preferable, please, to using the chat box. Of course, you can chat and raise points, but uh, the, the speakers would prefer it if you use the question and answer for more uh, detailed, um, more detailed questions. Uh, once the uh, opening um, uh, talks have been given, we will uh, transfer all of the participants into panelists, which will then facilitate your, um, your contribution. So there will be a short break of um, no more than about 20, 30 seconds while we move everybody over. So that will happen after the talks. Okay, so um, I'll, uh, I'll ask uh, uh, Moshe to begin, followed by Yasmin. Um, the, the format of the talks will be uh, for around about 40 minutes or so in total, maybe towards an hour. Um, and then I will take uh, three or four questions, uh, which will be grouped together and then the, the speakers can then reply to them, uh, do that in that way. Okay, so uh, off we go, and it would be Moshe speaking first of all. Okay, thank well, you, Moshe. Thank you. I think the, the, the title of this uh, session is a bit ironic. You know, after the American elections, <laughs> think, well, to quote uh, what Choin Lai is reputed to have said about the uh, uh, French Revolution, it's too early to judge. I mean, <laughs> things, have, things have yet not settled down yet. Um, uh, but I, I, I uh, try. I, I, my, my half of the talk will be uh, divided again into two halves, uh, roughly. Uh, one is I would like to say something about internal uh, Israeli politics. Uh, precisely because it's been scandalously underreported. Normally, uh, Israel is overreported in the British media, but uh, during the last uh, uh, year or so, maybe less than a year, uh, uh, there is very little information and things are going on there uh, which certainly merit reporting. Um, then I'll go over to the uh, the second half of my half will be about the, the new uh, formalized relationships between uh, Israel and several Arab countries. Uh, what do they mean? What do they uh, signal? Um, so to start with, I, I want to say something in general, which applies to both uh, these parts of my topic. And that is that on the surface, uh, things have a lot to do with uh, uh, incidental uh, uh, factors, such as individual personalities that are quite quirky. I mean, you have uh, uh, Trump in the United States, which is certainly not an not a ordinary uh, American president. I mean, his personality certainly has played a, a, a major role in, in uh, the events. And in Israel, as I will show, uh, Netanyahu uh, uh, has put his personal stamp on Israeli politics to the degree that no one uh, has done before. And yet, below the surface, there are uh, objective processes that are going on and are, uh, uh, as it were, expressing themselves through the uh, incidental and personal factors that uh, are visible on the surface. So, uh, uh, Netanyahu, you know, the Chartists demanded annual parliaments. Now, Israel has gone one better. It's, 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 it will have four parliaments in, 
in two years, which is sort of twice as often as the Chartists want, wanted. This, this is, by the way, the only demand of the Chartists that has not been implemented so far. Um, yeah. Um, but it all revolves through, I mean, and Israeli politics to an unprecedented and unequal degree is revolving through the personal need or a wish of uh, Benjamin Netanyahu to evade being sent to prison. He's uh, accused, first of all, uh, there was, uh, he was, uh, uh, th there was an injunction against him. Uh, and then he was actually uh, uh, put on trial. Uh, the trial is, is still supposed to be going on for various uh, um, uh, charges of bribery and corruption. And he is completely manipulated Israeli politics in order to avoid being, uh, uh, if possible, charged, stop the, the, the uh, 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 process. Um, by various means. I mean, he, he is seeking a, a government that uh, will be able to legislate immunity for an, a, an acting uh, a prime minister. By the way, there is a precedent in Israeli law that um, a minister who is charged uh, with uh, uh, corruption or whatever, who is, who is on trial, uh, must resign. A minister, but uh, according to the perverse interpretation of Israeli law, it doesn't apply to the prime minister. So a prime minister can serve while he's still on trial. There is no president. I mean, there, there, there has been a, a previous prime minister, Ehud Olmert, who was charged and then he resigned. He did the you know the, the the obvious thing, but Netanyahu clings to power, and he clings to power by all means, with the sole purpose of evading uh, uh, being sent to prison. And he, he he would like to do this by one of several means. One one obvious means is, is to have a government that would be able to uh, push legislation through the Knesset to give immunity to a serving prime minister. This is called the the French law. Um, because there's a French precedent for this kind of thing. Or to be able to serve in, a, 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 to, to uh, a, a construct a government which in, will enable him to nominate, to, uh, in fact, to, to uh, appoint the judges and the prosecutor in his own case. So if he can appoint the judges and if he can appoint the, the, the um, uh, prosecutor, then he, he will feel that he is uh, um, uh, free, get out of jail card. He's, he's got the get out of jail card. Um, and uh, uh, he's not only afraid of the present charges on which he's, he's being on, on trial presently, uh, there is a much worse a, a case of bribery and corruption for which he is not yet been indicted, but which threatens, I mean, more and more uh, uh, details about this. And this involves the unnecessary um, uh, purchase of submarines, which the Israeli Navy didn't ask for, but which apparently uh, 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 he ordered without any consultation with the Israeli Navy because uh, there was some some uh, bribery and corruption involved in this case. He, he, uh, he or his uh, close relatives profited from uh, the deal um, uh, and on top of this, he also, without consulting the Israeli military, uh, uh, recommended uh, that the supplier, the German supplier of submarines would supply uh, submarines to Egypt. You see, Israel has got a veto about uh, supply of, of heavy armament to the Arab states. Uh, uh, this veto is recognized both in the United States and in, in, the, uh, in Germany. Germany allows Israel to dictate whether it can supply submarines to Egypt. Uh, Egypt wanted to buy submarines. They consulted Netanyahu, and he gave it a, a, a green light without consulting the Israeli 
military. Uh, and, and they consider it as a threat to Israeli security. So this is a very severe charge. He wants to evade this. So what did we have? We had, first of all, uh, uh, an unnecessary election, unnecessary because the, the Knesset did not serve its full term by then, uh, on, in April 2019. He, he uh, dissolved the Knesset before it's the end of its term and declared new elections. Um, in, in these elections, he didn't get what he wanted. He got enough votes, enough seats to form a government, but not enough to pass the legislation that he is, was interested in. In fact, this created, this called for the creation of a new party, which uh, was called Blue, Blue White, the colors of the Israeli flag, on the sole ticket, I mean, the sole major demand was uh, uh, keep Netanyahu out of power. This, this uh, new uh, electoralist got quite a lot of seats. In fact, more or less the same number as, as Netanyahu as could, but they were not able to form a government. Netanyahu was able to form a government, but not, uh, uh, he did not get enough votes to pass the legislation in, in, uh, giving him immunity. So in September 2019, he again uh, uh, had, had Israel again had an election. Um, the same thing more or less happened. Um, the new anti-Netanyahu anti party got about the same number of seats as the Likud. So again, it was no good. And the uh, new elections were called simply for the, the I mean, the, there's no question about it. That, no one in Israel doubts that the whole thing was purely for the personal needs of Netanyahu. Um, so we had the elections in March last year. Then it was the beginning of the, the virus uh, pandemic and he managed to uh, lure the party that was formed specifically in order to keep him out of power to form with him a, coali a governing coalition. He made to them various promises that, that uh, he, Netanyahu, will serve uh, the first for, the, for one year and after one year uh, there will be a rotation and the head of that party, uh, uh, General Benny Gantz, will be the prime minister. Of course, that would mean that by, by March, uh, this year, uh, Netanyahu will cease to be prime minister and then uh, he would be in danger. He made absolutely uh, uh, ironclad uh, promises to Gantz that the rotation will take place. I mean, he swore by everything uh, uh, dear to him. But of course, uh, nobody believes anything that Netanyahu says. He's, he's uh, uh, referred to Israel as the uh, crook, the swindler. Uh, the cheat, they say, look, if he shakes your hand, check afterwards that you've still got your watch on. Uh, if you sell anything to him, insist on cash, and even then take every uh, uh, banknote and put it against the light to see that it's not forged. I mean, he's, he's uh, uh, regarded as, as a well-known liar and crook. Uh, but uh, you see, uh, he found some way to uh, undermine his promise to uh, resign the prime ministership after one year, and this has caused the the uh, he, he, after after uh, uh, making this promise and uh, uh, causing, of course, the the complete dem demolition of this new party. Blue White, which was formed for the express um, uh, purpose of, of uh, unseating him. Um, well, uh, he uh, he managed to find some technical uh, way of uh, getting out of this agreement, and this led to the uh, 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 dissolution of the Knesset. This time, 
and for a new election to be de de uh, declared for March this year. In the meantime, uh, the, this, this scandal has uh, called forth a big wave of demonstrations in Israel, of which the British press has reported nothing. You, you open The Guardian or any other British paper, you listen to the BBC, you hear about demonstrations in Thailand, in, in Ukraine, in Belarus, anywhere in, in the world. But a big wave of demonstrations has been taking place every week uh, in Israel since July last year unceasingly, and they, they've tried to get rid of it by using the, the uh, uh, virus uh, uh, pandemic as, a, as an excuse to prevent demonstration. The demonstrators uh, managed to evade this prohibition and the demonstrations are, are still going on. This is on the, on the surface, you know, it's to do with a, a individually with the, with the quirks of the Israeli serving prime minister, longest serving prime minister in Israel history. But underneath it, there is the, the uh, process that is objective and is going on and has been expressed through all these uh, uh, three elections and the next forthcoming four elections. And that is the shift, the constant shift of a, a Israeli politics to the right and to the extreme uh, uh, Zionist colonialism. Um, the reason why uh, the opposition uh, against him has not managed to un uh, unseat him is because the uh, the, there is a dwindling left in Israel, the Zionist left, obviously, that is not managing to uh, form a, a, an alternative government. Um, what is new now is that uh, facing this next election, there is a beginning of, a, 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 if you like, a dissolution or a, erosion of uh, Netanyahu's own party, the Likud. Some people for the first time have left uh, the Likud and, and have formed a, an alternative party from the right. And I must say that these demonstrations going on against Netanyahu are not uh, particularly left-wing. They, uh, they, 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 they have nothing to do with uh, occupied territories or with Israel foreign policy. They are purely uh, uh, demonstrations against the, the uh, stinking uh, uh, corruption of Israeli uh, uh, political scene. Of course, some uh, the, the, the corruption is such that some uh, uh, parties in Israel uh, exploit this corruption in order to get various uh, uh, benefits from Netanyahu uh, uh, in exchange for supporting him from a government. This is especially applies to the two uh, orthodox parties, each of which has about eight seats in the Knesset. Uh, one, one is mostly Ashkenazi, the other one is mostly uh, Oriental, uh, uh, Jews of Oriental origin. Um, uh, they quite cynically exploit the needs of Netanyahu in order to uh, 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 obtain benefits for their own uh, uh, constituency, for their own voters. Uh, Netanyahu has gone so far, of course, the, you know, the, 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 his, his anti-Arab racism is, is notorious. In the uh, previous election in 2015, he actually uh, urged his supporters to go to vote for him because the Arabs are uh, flooding into the, the uh, election polls. They, you, you, you must counteract the, the, the vote of the Arabs. Guess what? Now he's uh, managed to uh, uh, tempt a, 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 an Arab party to support him uh, in exchange for certain benefits. You know, the, the, uh, the Arab or Arab, Arab parties, uh, one of which is not purely Arab, the Communist Party, 
uh, some Jewish members, but mostly Arabs, uh, four Arab parties have formed a block uh, in order to uh, pass the threshold of the Israeli electoral law. Um, one of them, the most reactionary, is an Islamic party. And it is with this reactionary Islamic party that Netanyahu is now making a deal to support him uh, electorally to form or to form, a, 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 not to prevent him from, a, not to block his forming a, a government in, in, in exchange for some material benefits for their, their uh, supporters. Well, so, so this is how things stand uh, in, in Israeli internal politics. The, uh, demonstrations are still continuing, I, you know, uh, usually on Fridays. Uh, I've had uh, the weekly reports from Alex about uh, the un unstop unstoppable demonstrations. Um, in, in the meantime, uh, uh, you have this new alignment in the Middle East between Israel and some of the Arab states. Um, uh, this has been quite widely reported, and uh, uh, to some extent, at least on the surface, this is a, a, a parting present that uh, uh, Trump has given to Netanyahu, his best friend. I mean, the, by far the, the, the uh, head of government that was the best friend of, of uh, uh, Trump in the whole world is, is Benjamin Netanyahu. I mean, for, for him, you know, uh, uh, you know, uh, Trump was was just you know the the, the business. Um, so, um, what does this uh, entail? I mean, on on the face of it, on the surface, uh, this is just uh, being a formalization of uh, 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 quite friendly and warm relationships that have been going on for a long time. Nevertheless, uh, formalization of uh, 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 making official um, uh, a relationship that has been so far pretty, you know, uh, disguised and, and uh, undeclared is is a, 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 a political gain for Netanyahu. He's he's waved this about as a big gain for Israel. Now look, we have made peace with with the uh, uh, Arab state. Of course, uh, this is not exactly a, a correct description because you can only make peace with countries with whom you had the uh, war before. But none of these countries that has made peace uh, with Israel has, has uh, uh, was been in a, in a state of war with Israel. They have received various uh, 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 prizes uh, in exchange for uh, taking this step. For example, the United Arab Emirates uh, has received uh, a, the prize of getting um, F-35 uh, uh, fighters, uh, American uh, fighter planes, uh, and MQ-9 drones as, as a prize for agreeing to formalize the relationship with Israel. Morocco has received a, a, an even greater prize in exchange for formalizing its relationship with Israel. By the way, Morocco has had diplomatic relations with Israel before. I mean, it's, it's, not, it's not a new thing. There has been, you know, sort of low level diplomatic uh, relationship between Israel and Morocco for, for a number of years. Uh, but nevertheless, to make it official and, 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 and uh, upgrade the relationship in exchange for this, uh, Trump has recognized Morocco's uh, um, colonization of Western Sahara. So in exchange for letting you know, Israel off the hook in colonizing the Palestinian West Bank, uh, Trump has recognized uh, Morocco's right to Western Sahara, which is a sort of a, a big gift for Morocco as far as this is concerned. Um, Sudan uh, has given, be, been given the prize of being taken off the terrorist list. Sudan was uh, on the American list of uh, states supporting terrorism in exchange for uh, getting uh, into diplomatic relations with Israel, 
uh, it has been taken off the list. Of all the important Arab countries that um, have uh, that have not yet joined this uh, uh, charade, uh, I um, would like to mention Saudi Arabia. Saudi Arabia has not yet joined the queue of uh, relationship with Israel. And this has uh, um, something to do with the real process that is going on underneath. What is really taking place is a formalization and, and solidification of the uh, American, uh, let us say, uh, subservient states in the Middle East in a coalition that is meant for uh, uh, protecting, uh, defending American interests in, in the uh, area, all the junior partners and camp followers of the United States are supposed to consolidate their pact. Uh, it is uh, obviously uh, um, aimed to a great extent against Iran, uh, uh, about which I'm sure uh, uh, Yasmin will have something to say. Uh, the reason why Saudi Arabia has not joined is uh, that uh, what this new uh, set of diplomatic relations uh, signifies is that all these minor Arab states are, uh, uh, as, as it were, uh, forming a, a, a line behind Israel, who is the, the main junior partner of the um, United States in the Middle East, the, the, the main, uh, as it were, uh, protege or the main junior partner of the United States. Now, this um, is not uh, very welcome to some elements within the, the Saudi ruling class. Uh, there is a, um, a, a, a reportedly a, a difference on this question between the uh, heir apparent, the uh, MBS Mohammed bin Salman, the son of the uh, Saudi king, and the king himself, Salman. Uh, MBS, Mohammed bin Salman, is uh, was reportedly quite uh, ready to form, you know, to, to join the, the queue of uh, uh, those countries who are making uh, official uh, uh, relationship with Israel. Um, Salman, the king himself, uh, is worried of uh, uh, the uh, fact that this will actually demote the importance of Saudi Arabia. Saudi Arabia has some claim for uh, various obvious reasons to uh, uh, compete for the role of main uh, American uh, junior partner in the Middle East. Uh, it has both religious and economic uh, reasons for uh, uh, wanting this list. It doesn't want uh, to be seen to be, uh, as it were, behind Israel in the line of uh, American proteges. So, uh, so far, um, uh, this, uh, um, uh, you, the Saudi Arabia has not uh, yet declared its uh, readiness to form official relationship with Israel. Of course, unofficial relationships uh, uh, certainly exist and, and they are not, particularly secret. They are unofficial, but not secret. Now, uh, I will end by just pointing out one thing. You would expect in other times, let us say, if this, if this was uh, done uh, 10 or, or 15 or 20 years ago, you would expect huge uh, demonstrations uh, in various Arab countries protesting against uh, this formalization of relationship with Israel. Um, I think uh, it has been pointed out, I think Norman Finkelstein and other people have no, uh, uh, pointed out that the absence, uh, I mean, this is the dog that didn't bark, if you like. 
Um, and the, what this um, uh, signals is the uh, decline of the importance of the Palestinian issue in uh, the uh, Arab world. It is not that the Palestinian masses are not anymore uh, uh, in solidarity with the Palestinians. The solidarity still exists. But the centrality of the Palestinian issue uh, uh, is no longer there. You see, uh, until uh, 20 years ago, uh, the Palestinian issue was the central indicator of imperialist intervention uh, in the Arab world. It, is, it, it, was, it was the symptom of uh, uh, how the Arab world is, is, is being uh, exploited, oppressed, and, and uh, uh, undermined by uh, mainly American imperialism. Since then, so many things have happened. I mean, it's not just the, the uh, uh, COVID uh, pandemic. But it's the, it's the in, you know beginning from the invasion of Afghanistan through mainly the uh, invasion of Iraq and then the civil war in Syria, Yemen and and Libya. All these issues have, uh, uh, as it were, uh, pushed the Palestinian issue off its pedestal as the main issue that that is is uh, um, uh, let us say agitating the Arab masses in, in the rest of the Arab world. I think this is very dangerous because what it will mean, and uh, I think now connecting it with the uh, uh, previous part of my talk, uh, what will emerge from this next Israeli election, what, whoever actually formed the government will be again another shift to the right. So, uh, uh, the ongoing and increasing colonization of, of the, the uh, uh, Palestinian territories and uh, the uh, slow motion uh, uh, ethnic cleansing of Palestinians about which uh, uh, the, 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 there was a session of this uh, uh, communist university, I think yesterday, I'm, I'm sorry I couldn't participate. This. Uh, uh, will actually escalate, uh, and we have to watch out for for very dangerous and ominous developments on on, on this uh, front. So I, I end with this warning that uh, uh, nasty things are about to happen, especially you know on the Palestinian issue, and possibly also in vis-a-vis -vis Iran. I mean the, the assassination of. Uh, Fakhrizadeh, uh, and uh, which was meant to uh, really uh, form, form a, 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 if you like, a, a, an incitement for Iran to start uh, something that would uh, excuse uh, taking military steps against it. All, all this. Uh, all these dangers are uh, uh, still there and uh, are uh, about to increase and grow. So I will end with this. Thanks very okay, much. Uh, Moshe. Thank you very much, Moshe, and uh, hand over to Yasmin. Sorry, I thought you weren't there, so I was just going to continue. Uh, thanks very much, Moshe. In uh, the demonstrations on Wednesdays that were um, the pro-Trump supporters, one thing that dominated the Persian speaking me social media were uh, the royalists who were in the pro-Trump demonstrations. They had the flag of lion and the sun. They actually called Trump president of the hearts. Um, and there's good reasons. He's been very good to Iran's extreme right-wing groups. Financial support has flooded these organizations. And we have had since November, but also even earlier, I think even earlier, the threat of war. So it was going to be the October surprise amongst these people who were saying, um, I take it they weren't just speaking of their own accord. I assume they were prompted by the Trump administration. The Trump surprise was going to be the war against Iran. 
Uh, then we had the B-52 bombers flying over the Persian Gulf. The uh, uh, aircraft carrier NIMS was there to threaten Iran. And as Moshe uh, said, um, we had the assassination of Fahrizadeh, uh, clear, if you like, attempts at um, making sure Iran does something really stupid, i.e. attacks Israel or at Hezbollah attacks Israel and the war unleashes in the region. I must admit uh, the leaders of the Islamic Republic haven't survived 42 years uh, by being very stupid. They are not stupid and uh, this calculation didn't work out basically. Um, and of course the continued threat of war, which was serious. If you lived in Tehran, people did believe before COVID and even after COVID uh, that there was a threat of uh, bombing of something, not the entire country. No one expected an Iraq type invasion, but uh, most people expected um, some kind of attack. But also sanctions have changed the have changed in the last four years, the situation in Iran, and the Biden election has made a difference. Uh, this is very minimal. It might not be long term, uh, but for example, people tell me prices are about 20% down from November. This is partly because the exchange range rate is a bit better, but pa uh, partly because the threat of war is um, slightly reducing, although we still have until the 20th of January, who knows. Uh, but also because I think um, had Trump been elected, uh, at least the assumption was that there would be more sanctions, that these sanctions would be more punitive against Iran, and that therefore, um, uh, given that prices, exchange rates are very often projections of what will happen in future, as opposed to what's happening today, um, exchange rates would have been more uh, worse for Iran than they are. Um, so, uh, why was Trump so popular with the extreme right and, and indeed sections of the left? I will come to that. Despair amongst exiles means that um, it wasn't just the royalists, it wasn't just the Mujahideen, but former lefties who are now human rights lawyers, human rights activists, um, defenders of political prisoners, all sorts of people were hoping for regime change, Trump style. Um, and some of them are hoping Biden will continue at least that aspect of Trump's uh, policies. Um, not a lot will change regarding this issue. Uh, some of their official funding will be reduced. So the State Department was lashing out money for some of these groups. Um, that will be reduced, but this doesn't mean that, for example, all of this plethora of HR groups and royalists will not remain funded by foundations, institutions, uh, which are mainly financed by neoconservative uh, Republicans, by the State of Israel, um, and um, Democrats uh, who are pro-Israel. So that will continue. Uh, I think I will talk about uh, Middle East briefly before Trump and after Trump, but while we are looking at the Trump four years, you can't underestimate the fact that there were situations that um, made the situation that was terrible even worse. For example, the nomination of Pompeo as Secretary of State, he wasn't uh, the first Secretary of State during Trump's administration, but his nomination was a clear message to the countries of the region, including Iran's Islamic Republic, that torture is good. Torture is actually pays. You become even more important if you torture people. Because Pompeo, remember, is the man who admits um, uh, he was in charge during the Abu Ghraib uh, prison fiasco. Um, he's a man who defends waterboarding. Um, and so 
in my opinion, the, the four years of Trump have coincided with worse repression in Iran, contrary to what he, say, he thinks or what his supporters say, partly because it legitimizes um, unbelievable behavior. And uh, we have seen aspects of that. Um, I think um, Bin Salman uh, definitely thought he could get away with um, chopping up somebody who was a dissident, former ally of Saudi Arabia, um, in a consulate in Istanbul. And he did. He was right. He got away with it. He is still the crown prince of Saudi Arabia. Um, and some poor people who had nothing to do with it will be um, tried and some might face, have been tried and some might face penalties for it. So, and I think political prisoners inside Iran will tell you that the situation got worse in terms of torture. So I don't buy this opinion that there is no difference between uh, uh, Trump and anybody else who comes to the White House. These are minor differences, but if you are a political prisoner being tortured, it is important to you. Uh, it's not that minor. Um, having said all that, we have to remember that the situation in the Middle East was dire before Trump came to power. And we can't blame the horrible uh, wars in the region. We can't blame the terrible situations that faces Iranians just on Trump. Um, let's not talk about the century of uh, which started with colonialism, the collapse of the Ottoman Empire, the coup d'etat in Iran in 1953, the ethnic cleansing of the Palestinians, uh, 45 onwards, 48 in particular. Uh, let us not talk of uh, a century where after 1950s, the main emphasis of US foreign policy was to support jihadists, Islamists, um, at the expense of even nationalists, because nationalists could become pro-Soviet and therefore would be on the enemy camp. Nationalists could be a danger. So quite a lot of the, uh, if you like, Islamism that we saw in the Middle East is not unrelated to this paranoia of the United States. Um, against liberals, against nationalists, but most importantly, against the working class. Um, and as a result of this, we had this terrible century of what I would call colonialism, imperialism. But since 2001, and maybe earlier, maybe before that, we are looking at what I would call the scorched earth policy, i.e. destruction was on the agenda. The no one was talking about even exploitation. There wasn't even concern about exploiting the Iraqi population. It was to destroy the Middle East to make sure China, Russia didn't get cheap oil from the region. It was um, a policy of irrational wars, but in some ways, uh, wars that um, uh, made sense to the US because the policy wasn't to construct, it was its policy wasn't even exploitation. And remember that uh, the war on terror 2001 to 2016 before Trump was um, supported not just by George W. Bush, but also by Obama. Remember that um, the um, um, uh, coup d'etat by Sisi against uh, whatever we think of it, uh, 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 the results of the um, uprising in Egypt was supported and probably planned with the help of Obama and the Democrats. So um, I'm putting those 16 years uh, in front of you so that we don't have any illusions about what will happen now. We don't know, as Moshe said, we don't have a crystal ball to see the future, but we can predict that things aren't going to get fantastic. Um, so what will happen to the various issues facing Iran? And briefly, I'll talk about Saudi Arabia and Egypt. First of all, um, On the, on the question of the nuclear deal, 
I think Iran would have done a deal with Trump. The mid-Trump era, there were talks of various intermediaries, United Arab Emirates, um, various other governments uh, becoming intermediaries. And in fact, the Islamic Republic has a longer tradition of doing deals with Republicans than with Democrats. Iran Gate is an example, General Soleimani's enthusiasm for supporting uh, uh, the US invasion of Afghanistan, apparently giving up an address of the House of a Taliban leader in Mashhad so that uh, uh, assassination could take place in Mashhad. Um, and his enthusiasm for the US invasion of Iraq. Um, Ayatollah Khamenei's uh, main military man had this position about the US during George W. Bush. So that wasn't the issue. What really made it impossible in the last um, 12 months of Trump administration to do a deal with him was the assassination of uh, Soleimani. And I think that's why um, Iran having first despaired of a deal with Trump, then warming up to a deal with Trump, in mid-term um, for him, um, decided there was no way. And since then, they tried to stay calm, hoping uh, that Biden would get elected, and they did have that. Um, the new nominee by Biden um, is the man who took a, quite a, a lot, an active part in the negotiations of the Iran nuclear deal, what is called as GHC. NPOA. And um, although Iran has now announced a 20% enrichment of uranium, I don't think that's a deal breaker. These are all part of negotiations. In any negotiation as complicated as the nuclear deal, both sides will go through their maximums. The Americans are going to say, um, we want um, um, uh, uh, mm, the ballistic uh, issues of Iran, part of the New Deal, Iranians will say, no, we are increasing to 20%. And any um, negotiations that happens will take a long time. I would say three years. Maybe I'm being pessimistic, but I would say three to four years. So we are not going to see any immediate effect. What Iran is hoping, um, and they might not get it, but what Iran is uh, if you like, has um, banked on, is that um, sanctions will not, there won't be any new sanctions, and some of the punitive sanctions, at, especially the ones since 2017, will be removed. At least that the European countries that have not left the nuclear deal uh, will be able to make deals with Iran's Islamic Republic. And economically, that does make a difference. Um, uh, it makes a difference in that uh, Iran is not able to sell its soil. It is on its knees. All factions of the government, from the extreme conservatives to the liberals to the reformists, agree that um, without the lifting of sanctions, the survival is of the government is in doubt, and therefore they will all work towards that. Whether they will get there or not is a completely uh, different matter. Um, but I think in looking at um, Iran, we have to we have to say that the nuclear deal isn't the end of the story. The problems Iran, or the or even the, the if like execution of physicists, or they might make headlines or B 52s over the Persian Gulf. The question remains that the country is dealing with serious economic problems. And uh, we are approaching the 42nd anniversary of the revolution, a revolution that partly had a slogan about social equality. Even the religious people were using the slogan social equality. The gap between the rich and the poor is more than ever before. 
Iran is a country where, like what Ilan was saying about Palestine, is a very young country, uh, more than 75%, nowadays probably 80% of the population are under 25. Most of them um, um, are not interested in the slogans of the Islamic Republic. Um, some of them don't even have the political education or the history, aware of the history of the Palestine conflict, so they're not necessarily <clears throat> that bothered about Israel. Um, but they do, they don't want wars, and that's for sure. And I think in the short term, we could say that the likelihood of a war between Iran and Saudi Arabia, Iran and Israel, um, uh, military attacks by US have been reduced. I never say it won't happen, but they are considerably less. Um, and because other people have said it, I will repeat, let's forget about this nonsense about Shia Sunni conflict. There's no Shia Sunni conflict. The conflict between Iran and Saudi Arabia is about dominance of the region. It's about who will be the power in the region. And the Americans have inadvertently made Iran a very powerful government in the region by putting their allies in power, both in Afghanistan and in Iraq and Saudi Arabia, understandably feels threatened by this uh, and um, uses jihadists, Salafis, anybody it can to counteract this position that Iran has been propelled to. But the questions that will remain in terms of what uh, will happen in Iran are the questions of the economy of the country. I think young Iranians have given up um, fighting just for political or social or, or social freedom, not because they are not important, but because you can work around those. Political freedoms don't exist at all if you're an oppositionist, but social freedoms exist to, to a very limited extent. And because of that, you can, um, they are of, of, of a secondary importance to what is the most important issue. And that is the issue of jobs, um, lack of security, poverty, um, all of which are the results of um, the way capitalism has evolved during the last for decades, um, especially since 1990, the early 1990s, the end of the Iran-Iraq war. Um, in the next issue of Critique, we are publishing a number of articles on the political economy of Iran. Because in order to understand this massive corruption that is at the head of the, um, if you like, um, list of young Iranians' complaints, to understand how the government, a revolutionary government that was supposed to bring social equality has reached a stage where the sons and daughters of ayatollahs and senior government officials um, drive Lamborghinis and the poor um, scrape the rubbish bins in order to find food to survive. You have to look at how uh, the Islamic Republic has dealt with the question of um, ownership of capital, ownership of land, uh, the way religious laws have been used to allow um, misuse of land um, um, uh, rent and land ownership. And I think these are far more important. The government in Iran daily reports on the corruptions that exist, the um, billion dollar corruptions inside the country. And this is partly because the various factions of the regime approaching a presidential election are very good at exposing each other's um, corruption. What they don't do is expose their own corruptions, but there is enough, en enough factions with uh, power and access to the media that we can see that. So what has been um, the response of the existing left to this disastrous situation where the youth are rebelling. We've seen two major rebellions, 2018 and 2019. Both of them with no particular leadership, 
uh, moving at times to the right in the absence of any leadership. And the fact that the pro-royalist, uh, the Trump financed media then uh, only uh, shows the slogans of the extreme right. The slogans of the extreme right become uh, known in the outside world as the, the only slogans of these demonstrations. Um, the response of the existing left is disastrous. When I criticized Trump or Pompeo during the last four years, I got attacked by leftists, ex-leftists, but also leftists, that I'm strengthening Iran's Islamic Republic because the only persons uh, uh, that can bring regime change is Trump. So if you are stupid enough to be in that kind of position, you can understand what you, what kind of, uh, if you like, left we are talking about. Fortunately, most of this left that I'm talking about are exiled left and outside Iran. Um, but there are other uh, problems in this left. There is a disdain for organization. I echo what Ilan was saying. There is a no strategy. No one is thinking of strategy. There is movementism. Let's find a demonstration. Doesn't matter if the CIA has paid for some white flag with a scarf issue. We just follow it. We, it's a demonstration. So you follow it. You know, you don't use your brain. You just use the image that exists and you just follow it. And um, this disdain will, um, this disdain for uh, strategy, this disdain for any um, political thought will make a difference. Uh, let's unite with everyone. It doesn't matter if they're royalists. It doesn't matter if Trump has paid for them. That's our best chance. Well, if that's the kind of opposition you want to build, um, people like me should definitely be out of it. Um, but I do think, like Ilan, that there is hope in the youth in Iran. I think they, I, I follow social media of the young people in Iran. I meet quite a lot of them as postgraduates and postdoctoral students where I work. And I'm always impressed by how they are not at all affected by this um, mass media that is dominated by pro-West propaganda, how they have really seen through all the human right activities of the Democrats or Pompeo or anybody else. I'm always impressed at how deeply they think about issues. COVID has done us all a favor in some ways. Iranians are uh, very good at saying that at least we are not on our own because for, the, for four years, uh, Iranians were feeling really isolated, even in Europe. You could receive a, a birthday present from your family and your account in a European bank would get completely blocked because you were sanction busted. That was the accusation. The, the banks were worried that US will impose sanctions on them. So you were receiving 20 pounds as a birthday present, but you might be part of Revolution Guard's sanction busting event. So Iranian young people are very good at reminding all of us that COVID at least has showed um, that we are all in it together in some ways, that there is the, the gap between the third world and the modern advanced capitalist countries such as US and UK doing so badly in COVID is not that big. But also, uh, we are, uh, I think we are seeing the fact that amongst all sections of young people in the, in the Middle East and in Iran, there is no more this mm, idea of being mesmerized by US and UK. The two countries that are English speaking and dominate the political propaganda in the Middle East, people are following with great attention everything that happens uh, in those two countries. And they're not very impressed, is all I can say. I think they follow the number of deaths. Iran hasn't done well in terms of COVID. I'm not saying that, but it hasn't done worse than anybody else. Um, someone said 
Boris follows Nicola Sturgeon, where Iran follows Boris and Macron. So you have exactly the same um, lack of continuity, you know, economy versus health, economy versus hospital admittance. But at the end of the day, there aren't major differences. Um, I would, um, I had a few things to say about um, uh, Egypt and uh, Saudi Arabia, but I will leave them to the question time because I am conscious that I've spoken for a long time. Thanks very much. Thanks very much, uh, Moshe and uh, Yasmin. Um, we will now uh, transfer everybody over from being participants.